Today, it's the business of wind. China and Europe have been leading the way in the wind energy revolution, and now it's time for the U.S. to play catch up. I'm Chris Valerio, and this is Venture. Welcome to Venture, the world of small business and big ideas. We welcome Peter Mandelstam, the founder of Blue Water Wind, just one of the players leading the way in the renewable energy game. It's a scene that evokes the epic of Don Quixote. And like the windmills in Cervantes' classic, the wind energy has had its share of powerful foes. Yeah, terrible. The Kennedys at one point led a battle that left a Nantucket Sound wind project dead in the water. But that's in the industry talking points, that the yeah. Kennedys don't want it there because it's going to interfere with their views. That's just yeah. a bunch of baloney. There's, There's lots of other okay. locations. Put it on the back side of Nantucket. Never deterred by industry headwinds, in 1999, Peter Mandelstem founded Blue Water Wind. He had helped build wind farms in New York and Montana. But with Blue Water, he launched what seemed to be a quixotic quest. He shifted his focus offshore, where logistics were more challenging, construction was more expensive, and many of the laws governing the offshore frontier had yet to be written. These weren't totally uncharted waters. Offshore wind farms have been a success in European countries like Denmark. Getting his first contract was an uphill battle. Oil highs helped tip the scale, and Delaware was the first to to take a chance with Blue Water. Mandelstam has since worked his way up to what is known as the Mid-Atlantic Bite, developing offshore projects in Maryland, New Jersey, and New York. Across the country, wind energy initiatives are picking up momentum. Billionaire T. Boone Pickens has gotten into the game. We've got to get on our own natural resource, and that resource is wind first. The president is a supporter. It's energy legislation that will spark a clean energy revolution. And incentives are helping to fuel the wind rush. Let's not kid ourselves. It ain't going, no matter what the state does, without these tax incentives. Through the Recovery Act, invest about $14 billion in renewable by allowing wind producers not only to access the investment tax credit, but also support production tax credits. That's all good news to Mandelstam, but is offshore wind energy viable with oil cheap and without government subsidies? The answer, my friend, may just be blowing in the wind. Peter Mandelstam, thank you so much for joining us today. Good to be here, Chris. So, Peter, I have to start off by talking because I just found out that you were kind of a serial entrepreneur before am, you started yes. Blue Water Wind. So talk to me just about kind of, in a quick way, your progression to, to founding Blue Water Wind. I began my career in government and politics, and then in 1989, I read an article that changed my life. Bill McKibben, now very well regarded, had written an article in The New Yorker called The End of Nature. I became an environmentalist, I went to conferences, I founded a solar energy nonprofit, did that for several years, then founded an on land wind company, and then an offshore wind company. So it's really been an evolution of my own thinking to understand where can I make the greatest returns and where can I make the greatest difference, and that is offshore wind. Okay, so let's talk about for our audience the differences between offshore wind and onshore wind because this is certainly one of the issues that makes your company kind of unique with what we're seeing right now. So explain to explain to us real quick. Having done both on land and offshore, I really feel I understand the differences. In Montana, I had 8,000 windy acres. Great project, cheap power. Problem was I could only build a rather small project, although 100,000 Montanans are carbon neutral because of my project. When we think about the Mid-Atlantic Bight, we think about the Northeast, 100 million people live along the coast. They can get really all of their electricity from offshore wind. You're never going to ship power from Montana to Manhattan. Some of the arguments, of course, with the offshore wind is that it's kind of intermittent. You don't necessarily know when it's going to happen. So I guess one of the questions would be, when do you see, when is the energy the best? What time of day are you going to get the best energy from offshore wind? What, what, do, what can the East Coast expect from, from that energy source? One of the myths about wind in general and offshore wind is that you don't know when the wind is going to blow. In fact, with good meteorology, and I have five firms that have independently verified the wind, particularly for my Delaware project, those five firms have shown that the wind will blow and produce electricity 87% of the hours of the year. So in fact, you can predict the wind with a rather tight tolerance. And the utility that we're partnering with is going to get forecast 
day ahead, an hour ahead, and real time to know when the wind is going to blow. The other question I had just about kind of the offshore, onshore, why is it so much more expensive to do offshore wind? Boy, anyone who's done a project in the water knows that everything is much more expensive. The meteorological towers in Montana that I put up to survey the wind, $15,000. The, the uh, meteorological tower off Delaware that I just got approval for, $6 million. You've got to mobilize a boat, crew. It's really much more expensive. But the advantage is you're very close to the load. The 100 million people in all the coastal states, they'll never get wind from the Midwest. And there's no land available, empty land, in upstate New York or New Jersey, and certainly not in places like Delaware and Maryland. So really, the solution for them is to bring the power from the water. So a lot of it has to do with land source, too, in this area. Land use, yes. Yeah. And we're not competing with any other uses. When you founded Blue Water uh, Wind in 1999, what was the wind industry like at that time? Boy, it's amazing how I've really grown up with the growth of the wind industry. My first year, 1997, there were 200 people at the conference, and the industry did 11 megawatts. This past year, there were 23,000 people at the conference, and the industry did 8,300 megawatts. To tell you what that means, the 8,300 megawatts, 42% of all the power plants in the United States were wind. So wind is really, in terms of new power, the number one provider. The market wants it, the regulators want it, the industry wants it. It's really a great new source of technology. So from a small base, wind has been the fastest growing energy technology, and now in the market, it dominates all new power plants. And we're going to talk a little more about it with Mr. Peter Mandelstam. He's the founder of Blue Water Wind. Stay with us. You're watching Venture. Welcome back to Venture. I'm Chris Valeria. With us today, Peter Mandelstam, the founder of Blue Water Wind, and we were just talking about kind of the, the growth of the wind energy industry. Let's backtrack even more and talk about when you founded the company, Blue Water Wind, where did those initial startup funds come from? I mean, how did, and, and what were the first few projects? How did you start getting to be profitable? Like any serial entrepreneur, I took the profits from earlier businesses and put them into the next business. So when I had a success in Montana developing the first project, I took that money and put it into Blue Water. Earlier I'd done some housing, took that profit and put it into Arcadia, the on-land business. So like all entrepreneurs, I keep rolling up the profits into a bigger and bigger venture. And Did now, you have any initial kind of uh, venture capitalists or people that were also helping out? No, I applied and looked to folks on Wall Street and they laughed. And there's a story I tell <laughs> When I was the only wind developer in Manhattan, I would call folks on Wall Street, go visit them. They said, I'm making 100% a day in Enron, and I had a standard response. I don't know if Enron will be around in five or ten years, but if you own a wind farm, you'll be clipping coupons and making profits for 20 years, because all of the costs and all of the revenues are known and fixed, and that's been the case. No wind farm has gone bust, and Enron is gone. <laughs> Good example there. So when did you start becoming profitable? I mean, was it before we start talking about the Delaware project? Were you profitable before then? No, like all entrepreneurs, okay. I was putting a lot of money in seeding projects, and then you get big paydays when you develop a project. Okay, so let's talk about the Delaware project for our audience. In 2005, actually, back to, backtrack, in 2005, a professor and his class started researching <laughs> wind energy, yes. and that actually kind of opened the floodgates, correct? Yes, I've, I am one of those entrepreneurs that likes to read widely. So I read this New York Times article that made me an environmentalist, and I heard about this professor. I came to his class. I remember arriving. It was a handful of people in the University of Delaware, not a major university, but they were doing profoundly interesting and important work about offshore wind. I went to the class. I read a report from a student. I had my meteorologist verify it. From a student? Yes, and the professor. And lo and behold, Delaware has an enormous offshore wind resource. I started to engage. I opened an office. The Delaware legislature was concerned about price increase. You opened an office there. At yes. what point, I mean, did you so, you, so you read this report from a student, and then how does that progress to opening an office there? Like all entrepreneurs, you make an educated guess, okay. and then you really make your structure happen. So when I came into Delaware, there was a very narrow knowledge of offshore wind, but the legislature was mad. They were mad at price increases. And there was a competition for fossil fuel powered electricity. I came in, changed that, turned it into a competition for wind against coal, against gas, beat coal, beat gas, and won the offshore wind project. And let's talk about that because uh, it was NRG was the company with the coal plant, um, Connective was the nat gas plant, and these had very powerful lobbyists at the time. And you guys impl uh, applied kind of a strategy that I, that I thought was interesting. Your communications director just really kind of grassroots went on radio talk shows. What, what gave you that idea? And how did how much was the the citizenship of Delaware? How did 
I guess, how did you turn their opinion and, and up against lobbyists? The citizens really deserve the credit. As I mentioned, I began my career in politics. So I ran Delaware like a campaign, like a political campaign. Totally open, totally transparent, lots of time on the ground. I basically lived in Delaware for two years, went to endless meetings, educated folks, provided them information, and then all the various groups, religious groups, labor groups, environmental groups, citizens groups, mm -hmm. consumer groups, they all came to love offshore wind and blue water, and they were our champions. How many people did you have working for you at that time? In the Delaware Project, at one point I had 68 folks, and then tens of thousands of volunteers who came to meetings, testified, wrote comments at the Public Service Commission. So this was as much a volunteer effort as, I mean, these, this was a kind of, I guess you, you got the volunteer side of it to get involved into the... It was a grassroots effort of people who saw that there was a better way in Delaware. Delaware wanted to do something different. They were tired of paying ever higher fossil fuel prices. So people came out, they organized spontaneously, they testified, they wrote articles, they contacted opinion leaders, they contacted the governor, the candidates, and they did a lot of volunteer work. It was wonderful. But I had, of course, a professional staff. But you, it actually cost you quite a bit of money, too, right? Let's talk about kind of the, you had to have meteorologists, yeah, you didn't have to have people go and assure the public that it was safe for the birds. Yes, <laughs> you know, some called me uh, either visionary or foolish to spend $5 million of my own money, but it paid off. And we now have the largest contract in U.S. history. I thought that was a good investment in Delaware. So one of the questions is, how does this power connect to the grid? Like any power plant, an offshore wind project has a cable that goes to a substation, and that goes and gets distributed throughout the region. In this case, the cable is a little bit longer from the offshore into the land and then distributed like any other power plant. So are there any concerns of having to redo infrastructure in certain areas to accommodate this? No, actually. One of the beauties of offshore wind is all the electrical infrastructure in the Northeast has power plants on the land side and the load along the water. So the flows are towards the ocean, and those power lines are congested. But with offshore wind, you plug in from the water side and you have no congestion. So it actually makes the grid more robust. We're talking wind power with Peter Mandelstam, founder of Blue Water Wind. Stay with us, you're watching Venture. Welcome back to Venture. I'm Chris Valerio. We were with Peter Mandelstam, the co or the founder, I should say, of Blue Water Wind. Thanks for joining us. We were just talking a little bit about kind of the, the, the industry, the wind in industry, wind energy industry. One of the questions I have is, is you so much of what of what you did for this company and what you do is is on the political side and a lot of permitting, I, I guess I would say. What's the bigger obstacle for you in this case? Is it permitting or financing? I think the the challenge has been to educate folks. Offshore wind is new in the U.S., though well-established in Europe. There's been offshore wind in Europe since 1991. But in Delaware, for instance, they didn't understand about offshore. Obviously, the academics did. The goal was to get tens of thousands of folks and all the decision makers, the governor and the whole state legislature and the Public Service Commission to understand this. And that was an education campaign. So I'd like to say I'm a science teacher. I'm out there talking to folks, providing information. Everything that we did was on the public record, 6,000 pages on the PSC website. And a $1.5 billion project, correct? That's yes. what it's going to be. Yep. Well, the, the, to be fair, the Public Service Enterprise Group had to delay an offshore project because it wasn't able to get these federal permits to build these offshore things. So, I mean, that has to be an issue that you guys deal with. Uh, yes, you're right, Chris. I'm a chairman of the Wind Energy Group in the uh -huh. U.S., and I was very frustrated. From 2005 until two weeks ago, the permitting regime was not in place. The Bush administration failed to listen to U.S. law. Congress required them to do this in May of 2006. And from May of 2006 to a few weeks ago, the Bush administration didn't do this. Obama came into office, and Secretary of Interior Ken Salazar got it done in 100 days. And on Earth Day, they announced that the regulations were out. The president talked about the offshore projects in Delaware, New Jersey, said there was enormous interest, and the rules are not out, now out, and we have a roadmap to permit and build these projects. Well, and of course there's the Delaware-Biden connection, correct? I mean, how much of that played a part in getting this passed so quickly? The vice president has been a huge champion of offshore wind, renewable energy, and he's spoken well of blue water. We're obviously very grateful for his public expressions. The vice president in his speeches has understood that this is not just about 
jobs. This is about the economy. This is about clean energy. This is about stable prices. And of course, let's talk about the all-encompassing issue. This is about climate change. Delaware, the highest point in Delaware, uh, is a few hundred feet. I think the average height of Delaware is 60 feet. If the Antarctic ice shelf melts and if Greenland melts, Delaware is in trouble. So Vice President Biden understands that this is very much a local issue as well as a national issue. Peter, you're still really good at the politics part, i got to tell <laughs> you. <laughs> okay, well, here's a question, though. One of the issues, one of the things that people bring up, of course, is that there's so many government incentives going in uh, to develop these wind farms. And there's, I, I know one of the issues is these production tax credits because essentially people are getting federal tax credits for financing these projects. And it's great for companies like you because you can build bigger projects. But but some of the concerns being, well, you should apply the same types of credits to other kinds of clean energy, like nuclear energy, for instance. In fact, nuclear has a much larger and more lucrative credit. I would happily trade the very modest credits that wind energy gets for the other technologies. All energy technology is subsidized by the government. In fact, there are lots of studies that show that the fossil fuel industry and the nuclear industry get much larger subsidies. Do you so, think that that's sustainable, that an industry built on subsidies? I think that... In the case of wind energy, we are moving away from the subsidies. And on land, we've largely moved away from subsidies. Offshore is still <clears throat> in its infancy in this country, but of course in Europe it's established. So what we're seeing is a move away from the subsidies. We need to get the industry going offshore, then we'll move away. But let's remember, coal, oil, gas, and nuclear have had subsidies for 50 or more years. You mentioned Europe. Denmark is an in interesting case. 20% of, I think, their electrical mm -hmm. grid comes from, from wind energy. In the U.S., it's only 1%. I mean, like, let's be One honest One and a half here, right? and growing. Yeah, so do you see that? I mean, what percentage do you see that reaching in the next few years? Well, I think New York is a good example. I was chairman of the wind energy group in New York. In 1998, there were no wind turbines. But now there's 5% of New York is from wind. And so it's grown very quickly in a small amount of time. I do think in the next few years, we'll get to 20% of the U.S. energy from wind. 20%. You heard it from Peter Mandelstem, founder of Blue Water Wind. Stay with us. You're watching Venture. We're talking wind energy. Welcome back to Venture. I'm Chris Valerio. We're with Peter Mandelstam, the founder of Blue Water Wind. We're talking offshore energy, wind energy, I should mention. So let's talk a little bit about financing, because in 2007, you had an Australian investment firm, um, Babcock & Brown, purchase the company. How did that come about? I had uh, developed the company, brought it along to a very far extent, had one the Delaware project initially was looking for a big strategic investor to carry Blue Water to the next level. I sold a majority stake in Blue Water to Babcock but kept a buyback right. Sadly, Babcock got into trouble. They're now selling off their assets. I'm bringing new investment capital into Blue Water. Blue Water continues. There's a smooth transition from the Babcock investor to the new investor. So, where the, so is it one new investor or several new investors? Well, we've got a lot of people competing for our affections. Uh, Credit Suisse is representing Blue Water. A number of investors are looking at us. I'm confident in the next four or so months we'll find a new investor and transition. How much has your company the value of your company gained as Wall Street becomes interested in this wind energy, not just because obviously you have this contract with Delaware, but just the idea of the firm. I mean, how, what, what gain in that valuation would you it, It's hard. You know, entrepreneurs are always averse to putting a value, but I can tell you we have about 2,000 megawatts in active development with a total development cost of about $9 billion. And, of course, when we started, we were talking about projects in the hundreds of millions of dollars. But again, like what kind of, you've seen exponential growth in the, in the interest? Yes, oh, most definitely. Uh, we see the academics at the University of Delaware talk about, and the vice president has talked about, replacing all the electricity in the Northeast, all the heating in the Northeast, and all the transportation fuels in the Northeast from offshore wind. Today we've seen news that the president is going to go to a California standard for fuel efficiency. This talk of electric vehicles. The way to charge electric vehicles is with offshore wind. That's and something else to point out. I want to get back to the financial side of things just really quickly here. And have you ever thought about going public? I mean, you're looking for this new financing. Is the ultimate goal maybe to eventually go public? I think like a lot of entrepreneurs, what's important to me is to continue to control the company. And I think when you take a company public, you lose control. Mm -hmm. Having built a lot of successful companies, control has been important to me. I think I'll keep Blue Water 
private. <laughs> never say never, but I think I'll keep Blue Water private. Okay, and then the other question is, there's so many more people getting into this wind energy area. T. Boone Pickens, for instance. Yes. How is the competition? Uh, obviously, all of everyone's kind of competing for the next big thing, right? So how has that increased competition kind of played out in, in, in your strategy for the company? I, I welcome because you're the also co competing for financing, right? Yes, exactly. I welcome the competition because it shows the investment community that this is a ever better investment. So being in a crowd, and mind you, it's a still a rather small crowd, but there's lots of water out there and lots of ability to do lots of projects. So we're talking about hundreds of thousands of megawatts. The Delaware, New Jersey projects that I have ready to finance once I get the permits is 580 megawatts, about $2.8 billion worth of projects. When are we going to start seeing wind energy from that? Well, thanks to President Obama and Secretary Salazar, we're starting permits uh, in about a month. We got the final regs. We expect to go into the water two years from today. 2011, we'll have a nice... third quarter, still the goal? Yep, we'll invite you the ribbon cutting. <laughs> okay, well, one final question here. Are you guys going to bid on New York? Offshore? Absolutely, we're committed. New York's got a great opportunity. 700 megawatts in the ocean, 120 in the lake. Peter Mandelstam of Blue Water Wind. Thanks for joining us. You can watch more on Venture next week. I'm Chris Valerio. Thanks for watching.